It is so great to see you again, Molly. How are you? I'm great. Thanks, Mark. Nice to see you at home, <laughs> relaxed. Um, <laughs> you know, unfortunately, you told me no dog because I like when a dog comes into the uh, app. Yep, nope, unless the neighbor's dog gets over the fence. Um, no, no dogs. <laughs> a chance the two boys might run in, maybe? Uh, no, they know, they know not to come in at this point. They're pretty well trained, so I'm okay. not expecting that. <laughs> Although you never know. <laughs> There's always a first. Yes, let's go for the first. Um, well, um, people may not know, but I did a video interview with you a few years back, which was really cool. Yep. And so, uh, jokingly, this is, you know, Molly, this, Molly Mango, the sequel. Yes. <laughs> um, why don't, for everybody, um, why don't you just let them know, introduce yourself, let them know a little bit about you. Okay, sure. So, my name's Molly Morse. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Mango Materials. We're a startup company in the San Francisco Bay Area that takes methane gas, it can be any form of methane. We currently use methane from, um, it's a waste gas from a wastewater treatment plant in Redwood City, California. We take that methane, we feed it to naturally occurring bacteria that produce this biopolymer called PHA. We formulate this biopolymer um, in, in a special way for different applications that and it, this polymer is a substitute for conventional plastic. So we produce pellets that other companies melt down to make plastic packaging, plastic film, even fibers like a replacement for conventional polyester and apparel. One of the unique things about the way we produce this PHA is that it can be biodegraded. It can be prone to enzymatic attack in many environments, even if it's improperly disposed of in the ocean. So we address plastic ocean pollution. The other thing is, is that if it ends up in modern waste facilities like wastewater treatment plants, the biodegradation produces methane. So we can conceivably have this completely closed loop cradle to cradle cycle. Talk about circular economy. Nice. <laughs> exactly. um, no, it's fantastic. The first time I heard what you were doing, I thought it was fantastic. And it's becoming, it's become more relevant every single day. In yeah. fact, it's something we should talk about because we're working with the Cousteaus on ocean plastics. Yeah. So remind me, we'll, uh, we'll chat about that as well. There, yeah. could, be, there could be a play there. Um, so um, how's the business going? So it's great. Um, I mean, definitely a unique, interesting time uh, globally on planet Earth right now. But in terms of other businesses that are impacted, we're fortunate that we are at a certain stage in our path to commercialization where this economic global situation isn't impacting us quite directly yet. So our optimization, our operation, we're actually in construction right now and that is all ongoing. We're actually still still on track to meet those milestones. If this had hit even six weeks, six months before, six months after, it would have been significantly different for us. But um, yeah, we're plowing through. Things are continuing to scale up, commissioning our larger units, advancing our projects. So Good for you. Um, all, all things considered, I, I, can't, I can't complain, especially what other people and other companies are facing right now. We'll have to do a video every three years till you're like 50 just to do the whole thing. <laughs> yes. And I might mention that I am an eternal glass half full person, um, sort of an eternal optimist. So I don't know if that's part of the lens you're getting here, but like, I think if this had happened a year ago, it could have killed us. But I, I feel confident of, this, of where we are right now. That's, that's super great to hear. Um, um, you know, everybody talks about these days, obviously, the why. What's our why? And I had someone recently said, I'd do the what first, and then I go back to the why, which isn't so crazy. But yeah. um, share with us a little bit about your why, but also why do you do what you do? I can't help it. <laughs> it's just the way it <laughs> happened. Um, that may be the best answer I've ever had. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so I've been in to like, oceans and plastic pollution and just waste and garbage ever since I was very little. Like when I was in elementary school, I built a compost pile in my back, parents' backyard. Um, I've been, you know, fixated on where our trash went for a really long time. When I was an undergraduate at Cornell University, I took a class on, it was called solid waste management or something like that. But essentially, essentially we called the class trash, like a trash <laughs> one. Um, and so, I mean, I, this has been like a life long passion for, for, for myself. I, I 
when I got my, um, a sort of an accidental PhD student at Stanford where I was looking at biodegradable building materials and sort of a long story, but I was just very passionate about the topic. That's what drew me there. That's why I went and stayed at Stanford for my PhD. I wasn't someone who set out, um, you know, when I was little being like, I want to become a professor. I want to get a PhD. This is my path. I was just obsessed with this topic, found this path and it, it's, it's, it's turned o over the years, but it, I've sure. still, it's a fairly straight line from when I was really little until right now. And it just becomes more and more focused as we scale up. And it's, you know, I think it was Oprah or someone who said you become more of yourself over time or something. And that's definitely true for myself. Like as time goes on, as I learn more, I'm just more and more on this path to really change the fate of plastics and specifically motivated surrounding the problem of plastic pollution in the ocean. That's really my true calling, although my business touches on climate change, carbon sequestration, advanced biotechnology, and local manufacturing. But it's really my like northern light guiding star is um, plastic pollution in the oceans. Well, it just goes to show people that if you, if you have that passion of fixing a problem, if you will, you'll find whatever way to get it, <laughs> get it done. And that's what you're doing. And, uh, Yep. It's good timing. I mean, we're, we work with a lot of the SDGs as well, obviously. So always love the way to do. And I know you, as you said, you've been deeply engaged in from innovation to invention to entrepreneurial, et cetera. Um, sustainability, all the things we talked about, you know, bioeconomy, biodegradable materials. I'm kind of revealing the answers to the question I'm going to push out, but what the hell, um, you know, and it is a little bit of a push question. Um, what, may, what differentiates you as what we would call one of the leaders who care? Yeah, so I guess what really makes me unique is that I do have such a deep technical background. Like to be leading a company like this with a PhD in engineering, like I actually for a while took PhD off my business card until a couple, like it was actually oh, often women who would be like, you have to keep that on there. You have to show your technical pride. And I'm like, no, I like scare people. They see PhD and they're like, oh my God, like you're going to talk <laughs> like a professor, which a lot of my advisors say I sound like a professor when I talk. But um, in terms of being unique, like that, that, that is very unique. There are very few people that have that kind of technical background that are still leading the companies as they grow. Like maybe you are the inspirational idea and you do the first SBIR grant or something like that, but then to continue to lead the company as it scales up, as it grows, as we get further along that path of commercialization, I think that what, that's what makes me unique is that deep technical background. And if you want to talk about the rate of hydrolysis and the microbial penetration on the surface of the Polyhydroxy alkaline way to depolymerize it. I, I'm your person. <laughs> Let's talk about anaerobic biodegradation. Um, <laughs> but, um, but I think that you know that that deep scientific background is probably the thing that stands out the most. So tell me, is that how you and your husband connected? He wanted to have that discussion. <laughs> <laughs> now he just puts up with it. Um, <laughs> No, actually, I met my husband, like, freshman year of college. So, yeah, I mean, I was still like this then, but I wasn't so, wasn't so crazy then. <laughs> I can't even remember the whole thing you just said about the discussion. <laughs> Never mind having the discussion. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, no, it's really, it's really great what you do. And I, um, you know, kind of um, talking about family a little bit, Tony, it reminds me of my grandparents you say a lot of stuff there from Kiev, Russia, and Ukraine, and they would say um, constantly, they would say, um, as long as, you know, with the accent, as long as you have your health, that's the most important thing. And they worked really hard, and they were so kind and friendly to people and everything, but they really meant that was the most important. And I, I say that because, you know, this technology is moving super fast, faster every day. COVID is here, and it's impacting us like crazy, social, economic, the whole bit. But people are having a little more time, almost like an awakening to think and reflect and stuff and what's important. And so I'd love to get your views as to how you see the future looks, if you will, um, startups work, how we're going to do business um, in the future. Yeah, I know that's an excellent question. And it's something that I've actually been passionate about for a, for a very long time. And I think it's something I, I feel like the world and other people are finally catching up on. So I've always been very intrigued of either how you measure your life or how you measure your impact and being very, um, very thoughtful about planning for that, planning for my time. And I think what's unique about 
this moment in time is we have a lot of other people, whether it's leaders or just other people at companies who are reassessing how they spend their time, their work-life balance. Um, you know, I've never, and this is something that was like foundational in the culture of Mango Materials with myself and my co-founders. We were never about FaceTime. Like for sure, we love to spend time together and we have, you know, social events and things like that, but it's all about being as efficient and really more as effective as you possibly can with your time to make, you know, what's the core, you know, one of my favorite books is a book called Essentialism. Like, what's the most essential thing you could be working on? And especially if you're a startup company that doesn't have all the resources, you don't have enough time, you don't have enough money, you don't have enough people, what can you focus on, whether it's your business or your life, to, to make that change that you want to see? So I think, I think we're seeing a, sh a, a, a huge shift, whether it's business leaders or whether it's other people who are sort of reevaluating these decisions. So um, it's something... You know, I will continue to be on that path, and I'm just really intrigued to see how much of all this sticks. You know, after right. you know, in month, in the months and years to come. As in short memories we have. Exactly, uh, exactly. But did, you know, you raised a good point about um, what are you doing that's important? What are you doing that's essential? Uh, what are you going to yeah. do that's making a difference? And you know, related to that is. Um, you know, I really think it's it's two business leaders, business leaders who care that things are going to change. It's not just going to happen in, in some nonprofit somewhere or whatever. So what's your thoughts on what business leaders who care, the role they have to play with respect to, like you said, your employees, with respect to talent in general, because now people want to have their financial well-being but they also want to have their physical well-being and mental health is now critical. Yep. And they want that if they're going to join a company. They want that um, to be able to be in the best interest in performing in the company, but it also flows down into the community. So I'd love your thoughts on that whole, that whole aspect. Yeah, I mean, there's this whole discussion surrounding stakeholder capitalism and you know, how, how are we measuring the success? Is it just financial or is it some kind of double bottom line? Or my company is actually in the process of um, working to become a B Corp a B, uh, that shows that we're looking at something other than financial returns, just so that we can have everybody all, all on the same page there. So I think, I think it's an interesting time. I also, I've personally seen differences in different generations. So my company hires, I mean, we have high school interns um, and then, you know, all, all through, you know, um, you know, all, all through different stages of life. And it's really interesting the different leaders I see out there and their different take on these sorts of things. Um, you know, and a, a lot of maybe folks that are older than me might say about somebody like, like oh, she's so soft or, or, or something like that. But I don't know, and maybe it's also the point in my life that I'm at, but people were like, your workers, your team, they'll rem this is something I, I thought about when the pandemic hit, whether it was my team at, at work or whether it's my family, like, they're not going to remember the details of this, but they're going to remember how you made them feel and how you led them through this. So I'm a huge proponent of, of taking the long road here, thinking of the long, the long game, whether it's you know, my, my kids are still little, how, how do you make them successful adults? Or whether it's your workers, how do you long-term make your company long-term sustainable, not from a financial standpoint alone, but also from an environmental and from a well-being for, for your employees. It's much easier to keep the great team you have than to have to go out and find and hire and train. And what we do is really unique, like that, that could take a lot of time, much better off keeping the people that we have that we want to love and support. Yeah, no doubt. Even being in the search business, I advise clients that it, it's a lot more costly to, to use us to find, we'll find a great person, but yep. keeping the people is a, is a lot better. And, um, you know, you bring up some amazing points about, you know, being soft. Um, that whole thing about soft leadership skills or being soft is finally coming to, to play that it's, it's ridiculous. Um, yeah. Yeah. Vulnerability is good leadership skills and, and all that. And I think we talked a little bit before this call about how people are connecting in a, maybe a more authentic way online because they have to. And um, what I find also, it's, it's a hell of an opportunity for diversity and inclusion to take place now because it could be somebody in a, in a wheelchair, it could be somebody with whatever working remotely that does great stuff. And it's so, it's so important to take advantage of that opportunity of people's wisdoms and, and fresh ideas both talking about the young and the older. Um, and one of the best things I've ever seen is when 
um, we call them now vintage people. Um, <laughs> um, God knows what it's going to be called next, but someone vintage and someone young, and the, the vintage person is thrilled about learning from the younger person, and the younger person is thrilled about preventing mistakes th that the older person can help them with. This isn't rocket science, it's actually <laughs> collaboration. Um, so you're, you're in on the money, and um, so many people out of high school, they don't necessarily, I'm not saying don't go to college, but it doesn't necessarily make them not smart. Yep, I, I completely agree. And this was actually a conversation I had with my co-founders earlier on. So, you know, in, in some ways, um, we went to some of the best schools sure. on the planet, right? Um, but, and that was definitely the right path for me. Like I enormously benefited from my undergraduate and graduate education. There's no way I would be who I am today without those experiences. However, it's completely not for everybody. And I, even like my relatives are often like, Molly, don't say that to your kids. I'm like, I don't care, it's not for everybody. If they don't wanna go to college, they don't need to. It's a big waste of time and money for a lot of people. Um, it happened not to be for me, but I don't know. A lot of people use it just, you know, to chill out and party for four years. I guess if you can do that, like, more power to you. But like, I mean, what's, what's, what's the point? Um, so. And not to judge, not to judge somebody that became a plumber, not to judge somebody that went to this school instead of this school. Um, completely. You know, bring value to the table. Yeah, no, and not only that, it's often a unique skill set, like being able to hear a pump and instantly know how it's cavitating, like that's something you never learn in school. Like for a company like mine, that's intensely valuable. Um, I'm not even sure what cavitating means. <laughs> <laughs> it's like vibrating or there's problems. No, no we don't want our problems to cavitate. Um, but it's like, great, you can have a PhD from a very fancy school, yeah, and you won't know, like, who cares? <laughs> so. I think it's, it's brilliant what you're saying, and um, I love that you used my favorite quote of all time, which was Maya Angelou, when you said how, how, uh, how you make people feel. Oh, yes, 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 that is her. And that, yeah. and it was, that was brilliant. <laughs> so, um, and you talked about essentials before. Last question, yeah. I guess, in this segment I want to ask you is, pretend I'm a college graduate, I'm not, didn't have my graduation. There's jobs are even less than they were before, which was tough before. And coming out of high school or college, whatever, and I, I come up to you and I say, well, man, what next? What now? What do you tell them? Well, I guess I, I would say something kind of to recap what I said earlier. I, I believe in taking the long view. So, and I do believe in like following your heart and following your passion. However, it also needs to be something you need to think about the financial ramifications for it as well. Like I completely respect folks in the artistic community who that's their passion. They make it work. It's really hard. And a lot of them are immensely talented and probably don't get compensated the way they, 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 they should. So I'm not saying like always just like follow your dreams because you need to think about, you know, how you're going to pay your bills and things like that. Yeah. But I guess if you just graduate and you're looking around, I, um, I would think about where, where do you want to be in the future in, in a couple years from now. And if you don't know, think about just what's the next right thing to do. Like you have some bills to pay. You need a job. What's your skill set? What do you enjoy doing? And there's a lot of different ways. I love reading books on this subject. People always say like, oh, think of what kind of pain you can bear because everything will be some degree of miserable and just pick like, what's the pain you can put up with and go that route. So I guess if it's like the pain of not having a lot of money and you're really passionate about something and the arts, maybe, maybe you follow that because that's a path you can bear. Maybe you, you don't mind working really long hours because you love something else and you get paid really well. So working long hours is a path you can bear. I like, I love being creative. I love science and technology. I love thinking about how we are gonna solve these problems that no one on the planet has ever thought about before. Like that's what I personally love. I've always been passionate about it and I found a way to make a career out of it. And yes, it's been hard, it's been really stressful. Um, but it's something that I always feel like completely comfortable going to bed at night with the decisions that I've made and the power that I've had. But for other people, that'd be really stressful. Like I have employees and team members there. If, you know, if I'm not successful fundraising, like their kids might not have childcare, right? Like that's a unique pressure that I have to face that other people wouldn't be able to live with. So, um, yeah, <laughs> I'd have a whole long list of books for them to read if they were asking me this. <laughs> but I guess in a nutshell, I would take the long view. I would think about what the long view is, and then I would focus on what's the next little right step they could do right now. 
brilliant. I know exactly what I'm going to do now. <laughs> <laughs> That's for a, 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 a reading list. <laughs> it's been a long time, but you know, it finally made it clear for me. <laughs> Um, thank you so much. Like what you should have what, what you should know in your thirties, um, which like uh, you're supposed to read it when you're like in your early twenties. But I recommend that book to everybody. Well, the other good question that you've seen that, and there's one one guy that did this. He took a film of himself when he was 18, and then he took a film of himself when he was 60, and he merged them talking to each other. In other oh, words, what would I you have... tell yourself when you're younger? Yep. Um, I don't remember the name of the movie, but it was brilliant to see the interchange same person interchange yeah. oh so. cool no i haven't seen that very cool hey as always thanks so much you're uh, you're amazing <laughs> thank you mark <laughs>